All right. Well, uh, good evening and good middle of the night to some of you. Uh, thank you for uh, joining me uh, for this uh, sort of public version of a conference presentation that I'm giving tomorrow in the Global Philosophy of Religion Conference. So this talk uh, that I'm giving is called Islamic Neoplatonism, a Contemporary Alternative to Analytic Theism. So uh, just for some information, my own background and academic discipline is Islamic studies. I am a historian of Islamic thought and a specialist in Quranic studies and the Ismaili tradition. So I don't formally work in the philosophy of religion, but I am an assistant professor of religion and I've always taken an interest in the philosophy of religion. So this is sort of like my attempt to enter into the philosophy of religion uh, conversations. Uh, so that's what this is supposed to be, although I don't formally work in this field. So what exactly uh, am I doing? Um, this is sort of like a philosophical intervention that I am offering to the philosophy of religion. And here's why. Uh, the philosophy of religion, although it's called that name, in reality, it is very much the philosophy of Christian theism, right? So if you pick up these major titles in the philosophy of religion, and I've put some of those titles uh, on the slide here, you will notice that when theism is talked about, when they talk about arguments for the existence of God, when they talk about divine attributes, divine action, by and large, they are speaking from and towards a Christian context, a Euro Anglo American Christian context. Uh, and, and that's a bit of an issue because other religious traditions, which are quite rich in philosophy, Hindu tradition, Islamic tradition, Jewish tradition, African traditions, they get almost no representation in the philosophy of religion. Uh, so that's quite imbalanced. And this is the observation of the scholar, professor of philosophy, uh, Timothy Nepper, in his book, The Ends of the Philosophy of Religion. So he has noted, uh, quite rightly, in my opinion, that in all these different edited volumes and major essay collections in the philosophy of religion, uh, what they tend to talk about uh, is not the historical religions. And even when it is, it tends to be a philosophically rarefied Christianity. Uh, he goes on to say in this same book that uh, you can just read the table of contents of some of these major volumes, and you know that the analytic collections are almost exclusively occupied with Christian theism. So you could do this. You could take, for example, this book, the middle book, Philosophy of Religion, a Reader and a Guide, and the topics that they deal with are always talked about in a Christian context. Uh, you don't hear material from non-Christian thinkers and non-Christian perspectives are simply not considered. So I've noticed this as well. And the topic that I've always been interested in academically and intellectually are what some people call God arguments. What do I mean by God argument? Well, this is a branch of philosophy and theology known as natural theology. Uh, the way natural theology tends to work, so when you, when you want to make an argument for the existence of God or some sort of metaphysical reality, uh, you make a certain observation about the cosmos, right? You point out a feature of the cosmos, and using some form of induction or deduction, syllogistic argument, you posit or you infer that the existence of a certain feature or quality or process in the universe uh, entails the existence of some metaphysical or supernatural entity that is required to explain a feature or process or behavior of the cosmos. So what do I mean by this? So here's some examples for you. Uh, we have the observation by many philosophers that this physical universe 
has a finite past. That is to say, the physical universe began to exist at a certain point in the past. Not everyone agrees, but many philosophers and scientists sort of take this point. So one argument that begins with this fact is known as the Kalam argument. And what the Kalam argument does is it reasons from the temporal beginning of our universe to the existence of a powerful supernatural metaphysical cause or creator of physical reality. And that's not the only argument. Uh, there's the fine tuning argument from the laws of nature, right? Which talks about the laws of physics, the mathematics of the laws of physics. And that argument infers a cosmic intelligence that has actually done the fine tuning. Uh, there's a more general argument known as the nomological argument, which reasons and deduces from any laws of nature towards the existence of a cosmic lawgiver. The moral argument, which is talking about the need for a metaphysical ground of objective moral values. Uh, there's an eternal truths argument uh, known as the conceptual argument, which posits the existence of an eternal intellect in which any sort of eternal timeless truth exists. And then there's also a contingency argument which reasons from the existence of contingent beings in the universe to the existence of a necessary being. Now, what's very interesting is all these arguments that I've shown on this slide, uh, they're all current today in the philosophy of religion. Like all these scholars are taking them seriously. They're debating these arguments. But what I found interesting is that there seems to be an assumption on the part of Christian theologians that all these arguments are talking about the same entity, which would be the God of Christian analytic theism. In other words, when people use all these arguments together, there is an assumption that the Kalam argument and the fine tuning argument and the contingency argument that they refer to one and the same God or supernatural being. Uh, and this is actually an assumption. We, we don't really have logical demonstration that this is the case. We don't really have a logical demonstration that all these different arguments actually refer to the same entity. And that there are other worldviews which could be constructed using these same arguments that are different from Christian analytic theism. So one of those worldviews that I would ask us to consider is what I call Islamic Neoplatonism. What does that mean? Islamic Neoplatonism is a metaphysical, a cosmological, and also a theological worldview that Muslim thinkers in the 800s distilled from the Arabic translation of the writings of Plotinus, which erroneously was called the theology of Aristotle. And the first Muslim Neoplatonist or one of the earliest ones is the person known as Al-Kindi who was sort of responsible for this translation project uh, in the first place. So in this diagram here, I have uh, depicted visually the actual worldview of Islamic Neoplatonism. And the fundamentals of the worldview are as follows. The most fundamental absolute reality is what we call God. God is an absolutely simple, unconditioned reality, a necessary being. And there's only one because God is absolutely simple. Then under God, instead of saying that you just have the universe with all its physical properties, the Islamic Neoplatonist worldview has a much more layered and hierarchical understanding of the structure of reality. So in Neoplatonism, God does not directly create physical things that we're familiar with. Rather, God eternally brings into being and sustains the first contingent or the first conditioned reality, which is called the universal intellect. And the universal intellect is an immaterial, eternal uh, mind of sorts that is always thinking the eternal necessary truths and the platonic forms. So that is a universal intellect. And then from that universal intellect, there emanates, there comes into being another entity, which is also metaphysical, called the universal soul. 
And the universal soul is directly responsible for the production and the regulation of what we call the physical world or the cosmos. So that is the bare bones of the Islamic Neoplatonic worldview. And it's very different from the worldview and the ontology of Christian analytic theism, which completely dominates the philosophy of religion field. Now, this Neoplatonic worldview, it was actually naturalized into Islamic philosophy. So there are multiple schools of Islamic thought that completely embrace this Neoplatonic worldview. Those include uh, what is known as Islamic philosophy or falsafa, Shi'i Ismaili thought, uh, Sufi mystical thought, and Twelver Shi'i philosophy, especially in the Safavid and post-Safavid era. Uh, now, the reason why I'm calling this Islamic is because this worldview uh, had a very deep influence in Muslim understandings of cosmology, mystical practice, Quranic interpretation, ethics, and ritual. So it was not just a form of sort of window dressing or sophisticated language. The Islamic thinkers who adhered to Islamic Neoplatonism, they uh, wrote and they thought and they interpreted the world and they interpreted their faith with this worldview very much at the center and at the core of their thinking. So I've put some names on my slide. For those who are interested, I'm, I've done some name dropping here. Uh, these are some of the great Muslim thinkers over the past 1,000 years who actually adhered to Islamic Neoplatonic metaphysics and cosmology. So you see some familiar names like the Ikhwan Safa, like Ibn Sina, like Nasser al-Husru from the Ismaili tradition, like Nasser al Tusi, who was also Ismaili. Uh, you have Sunnis here. So uh, Af Afdal al-Din Kashani is a Sunni. Ibn Arabi, Jalal al Rumi, the Ibn Arabi school of interpretation that includes many thinkers. Um, you also have uh, Twelver Shi'i thinkers in the Safavid era, like Mir Damad and Mullah Sadra, and even someone like Shah Waliullah, of Delhi, who's a Sunni Muslim, even he uh, believed in this Neoplatonic worldview. So this is this is actually quite a major worldview that, for whatever reason, uh, has been neglected in today's uh, discussions. Not in the academic study of Islam, where everyone knows about it, but in the philosophy of religion. So in the philosophy of religion, these ideas. Uh, what they debate, they are debated and discussed as if these are real, you know, real truth claims. Whereas when you can, when you study this in Islamic studies or history, uh, none of this is studied as a living tradition. So what I'm saying is that we could use the, the resources in the philosophy of religion, we can use those arguments, and we could actually present a case an intellectual case, not a scriptural case. We could present an intellectual and philosophical case for this Neoplatonic worldview. So over the next bit, um, this is what I'm going to try uh, to do with you. I'm gonna to try to make that case. So how do we begin? Um, I will begin with a modern rendition of uh, Ibn Sina's argument for the existence of an absolutely simple God or necessary being. Uh, and what I've done is I've actually retooled Ibn Sina's argument using a contemporary argument by the Catholic priest, uh, Robert Spitzer in his book, New Proofs for the Existence of God. So I've sort of merged these arguments together. So what I'm presenting, it's neither purely Avicenna nor is it purely Robert Spitzer. It's my own synthesis of both in a way that I think uh, you know, works the best. So uh, Spitzer and Avicenna, broadly speaking, um, when they begin their argument by distinguishing intellectually uh, between uh, two types of realities. The first type of reality is what we would call a conditioned reality or what Ibn Sina calls a contingent being. Uh, this is any reality, any, any existent, uh, when it ever it exists, it depends on another reality in order to exist. All right. So a conditioned reality is any reality whose existence at any moment is dependent on something else. 
That's all it is. And uh, this would be, theologically speaking, this conditioned reality would be what you classify as not God. All right? Because remember, if you want to prove the existence of God, uh, you need to define, well, what is the definition of God and what is the definition of not God? So a conditioned reality, theologically speaking, is not God. Uh, what is an example of a conditioned reality? Um, the example that Robert Spitzer gives is a cat. So if you consider the existence of a cat, uh, in other words, a living cat, and all the properties that this living cat has, this cat only exists at any moment because internal to the cat and external to the cat, there are other realities that exist. And the cat's existence depends on both external and internal realities. So if you just look inside the cat, you notice that the existence of the cat depends on the existence of its bodily organs, which are made up of cells. So a cat is a conditioned reality, right? If anything happens to certain cells or organs, you don't have a living cat anymore. And then those cells, if you consider the one cell, for that one cell to exist, uh, there has to be a certain you know, uh, composition within that cell, uh, which is constituted by molecules and all sorts of uh, internal uh, cellular material. So the, the cells are also conditioned realities. And mo a molecule, in order to exist, a molecule depends on its uh, atomic uh, on, on the atoms uh, that are bonded to make that molecule. So a molecule is a conditioned reality. And, and, and there are many examples of this. So when we're talking about a conditioned reality, uh, we're not talking about something that has to begin to exist. I'm not talking about how the cat you know, came out of its mother's womb or anything like that. I'm talking about the existence of the cat at any moment. At any moment, the cat is a conditioned reality. So that's the first thing to understand. That's what we mean by conditioned reality. So even my computer right now is a conditioned reality. It has all these parts. The parts have to be arranged in a certain way. If you change the arrangement or if I lose one of those parts, this computer will shut down, which I hope it doesn't because I'm presenting right now. So the opposite, the logical opposite of a conditioned reality is an unconditioned reality, right? Any reality that does not depend on anything else to exist. So just this the opposite. And the unconditioned reality, which is known as a necessary being, that would correspond to what we are calling God, right? For the purpose of this analysis. So these are just definitions. And I would say at this point that we are not committed, we are not assuming that any unconditioned reality exists. We don't know that. All we know at this point is that some conditioned realities exist. That's all we know at this point. We don't know that there actually is an unconditioned reality because there could be none. We haven't not checked. So let us begin our analysis. So we can do this analysis by using a, a sort of type of argument in logic known as a disjunctive syllogism. What we're going to do is given these two definitions, we will ask the question, um, what are the possible states of affairs for all of reality, given the definition of a conditioned and an unconditioned reality? What, what are the possible states of affairs? So we'll express that using a disjunctive syllogism. What that means is that I've isolated the possibilities to two states of affairs. They cannot both be true and they cannot both be false. If one is true, the other is false and vice versa. So that is a disjunction, which is of course, uh, you know, a type of structure, type of argument uh, in, in logic. So what are our two cases? Well, option number one, so state of affairs number one would be that there is no unconditioned reality. There are only conditioned realities. That is option number one. And I'm going to call that scenario P, all right? State of affairs P. Option number two, which is the logical contradictory of option number one, is that there is at least one unconditioned reality in all of reality. So that's the second possible state of affairs. And you can only have these two. These two are what you call logical contradictories. So you can only have these. If one is true, the other is false and vice versa. So I'm going to call the second option, 
at least one unconditioned reality, scenario Q. So we have scenario P. Now, theologically speaking, P is no God, only conditioned realities, and Q is at least one God. Those are the scenarios. So now how would we prove that scenario Q, at least one God, at least one unconditioned reality is correct? Like, how would we prove that? We obviously cannot go search all of reality with a microscope like that. Will, I mean, good luck if you want to try. We can't do that. Uh, we have to simply use deductive logic. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to use a disjunctive syllogism. In other words, either P is correct or Q is correct. I cannot positively prove Q like empirically, directly. What I can do is I can try to disprove P. If I can show that scenario P, the scenario that says there are only conditioned realities, if I can show that this is false, it would logically follow according to disjunctive syllogism that P, there is at least one unconditioned reality, is true is, uh, sorry, Q, let me rephrase. If I can show that scenario P, there are only conditioned realities, is logically impossible, it would follow from that, according to the disjunctive syllogism, that scenario Q, there is at least one unconditioned reality, is true. And this is, this is the path that we have to take when we're doing philosophy. There's just no other way. So I'm going to try to present this argument in a visual manner, and this is where the slides become important. So let's visualize this. So let us just say that something exists, all right? Something exists, and, you know, because we can observe it and analyze that something, whatever that is, some X, uh, let's just assume that it is a conditioned reality, because we know that there are conditioned realities, right? Like we, we're, they're all around us. I know I'm a conditioned reality. I can tell you that much. Even if the rest of you don't really exist and you're just existing in a dream in my mind, I know I'm a conditioned reality. I did not exist forever. And if you take away the oxygen in this room and you take away the atmosphere, I would no longer exist for sure. Uh, so I'm a conditioned reality. So some, some conditioned reality exists. And that conditioned reality, uh, by definition, it depends on something else. So this conditioned reality, and you can put whatever you want as a placeholder, uh, it depends on something. And it either depends on an unconditioned reality, in which case, hey, if you want to concede that point, we can move to the next step. So either it depends on an unconditioned reality or it depends on another conditioned reality. And we'll, let's try to be really difficult. So let's say that it does not depend on an unconditioned reality because we don't want that result. So now we have a conditioned reality that depends on another conditioned reality. So then what we do is we ask the same question of the next conditioned reality. It either depends on an unconditioned reality or it depends on another conditioned reality. And then that one will ask the same question. And then the next conditioned reality, let's keep picking conditioned realities for the hell of it. So now let's say we have an infinite number, okay? An infinite number of conditioned realities. Each one depends on the next one in order to exist. That's the scenario we're looking at. In fact, let us say that we have the set of all conditioned realities, okay? And there's an infinite number of them. So I have a, a whole group of only conditioned realities, each one depends on the next one. And I just have an infinite number of these guys. So then here's the question. The entire set of conditioned realities, the entire group, let us pose our question about the group. The group of infinite conditioned realities is the group as a whole, taken as a whole, is this a conditioned reality or an unconditioned reality? All right? Is the entire group of infinite conditioned realities, is that an unconditioned reality? Well, the content of this group is nothing more than conditioned realities. There's no unconditioned reality within this group. So the group as a whole, because it's, it's all of its members are conditioned realities that depend on something else, the group as a whole cannot be an unconditioned reality. It's simply not possible. If we were to suppose that the whole group of conditioned realities 
somehow magically constitutes an unconditioned reality, what we would actually have is an unconditioned reality that is dependent on the aggregation of conditioned realities. And anything whose existence depends on the aggregation of other things is not unconditioned to begin with. So the only option, logically speaking, is that the set of all conditioned realities itself is conditioned and dependent on something else. At this point, somebody might say, great, let us introduce another conditioned reality and say the set of all conditioned realities depends on that. The only problem with that is that this extra conditioned reality that we smuggled in technically must already be a member of the set of all conditioned realities. So now we have a problem. We have the set of all, of all conditioned realities, which itself is conditioned, which depends on something else to exist, but it cannot depend on another conditioned reality. So we are left with one logical option. The set of all conditioned realities, even if they be infinite, depends on an unconditioned reality. So we have actually, using deductive logic, using the disjunctive syllogism, we have shown that at least one unconditioned reality actually exists, at least one. That's what we've done so far. Now let us do some further deductions. So if you know that at least one unconditioned reality exists, we can make some further statements on this ground. So every unconditioned reality, and there at least one exists. At this point, maybe a thousand exists. We don't really know, but we know there's at least one. So this unconditioned reality is uncaused because that's what it means to be unconditioned, right? It does not depend on any other cause. It has no cause, and therefore, it would be absolutely simple. That is to say, any unconditioned reality has no parts whatsoever. It has no constituents. It's not composed of anything else. That's what it means to be absolutely simple. If the unconditioned reality had parts, if it had any internal ontological diversity and boundaries, it would depend on those parts and it would only exist through the combination and union of its parts or its constituents, even if these are said to be internal parts. And if the unconditioned reality had parts and therefore existed through its parts and dependent, depended upon its parts, we're no longer talking about an unconditioned reality. We're talking about a conditioned reality. So that doesn't work. Therefore, every unconditioned reality has no parts. Next, could there exist, logically speaking, two or more unconditioned realities. Because right now we've only proven that there is at least one. We have not ruled out you know, 10, 15, or 20. So let's ask the question, could there be two unconditioned realities? Well, let's think about it. So if you had two, re two unconditioned realities that are actually different, okay? They're actually two. We're not just saying there's two, but there's ontologically two. Each unconditioned reality in order to be different from the other one, it would have to have something, some component that the other one did not have, okay? So there, each unconditioned reality would possess a differential factor, a differentia. At the same time, these unconditioned realities are two of a kind. So each one would share with the other something that is common, a shared property in a sense, a shared feature. You could even say they share an essence, but in order to be different, each of these, even though they have a shared essence, uh, they would possess uniquely a differential factor in order to be truly different. So visually it looks something like this. Now, some of us might say, well, that's great. No problem. I love things being shared. The problem here though, is that in this situation of two unconditioned realities, Neither one of them is absolutely simple. They actually both have parts. They have at least two parts. If there are two or more unconditioned realities, each unconditioned reality has two or more parts. 
And if that were the case, then each of these two unconditioned realities in having parts is not actually an unconditioned reality. Therefore, it follows, logically speaking, that there is only one unconditioned reality. So we said earlier that there is at least one, but due to the absolute simplicity of any unconditioned reality, there's only one unconditioned reality. Furthermore, going by the fact that there's only one unconditioned reality, it would mean all other realities, anything you can think of. So I'm not limiting reality to the physical universe. For all I know, we live in a multiverse, right? For all we know, there are many universes and maybe they're parallel universes. Maybe there's some realm where the Harry Potter characters actually exist. Maybe Neverland is real. Maybe there's a dream world. For all we know, there could be, there's much more to reality than we think. However, if you know that there's only one unconditioned reality, all these other realities, real, imagined, soon to be discovered, yet to be discovered, all other realities are conditioned realities. And being conditioned realities, all realities depend directly or indirectly on this unconditioned reality in order to exist at any moment they exist. So that's one of the things that you learn, just logically speaking. And we can also conclude, and I can't go through all the details, but this unconditioned reality must be eternal in the sense of timeless. It does not change. If the unconditioned reality had any change, if it undergoes any change, it's no longer an unconditioned reality. It would have parts. Uh, and of course, something would cause it to change. And if it is caused to change, then it's not unconditioned. The unconditioned reality would have to be immaterial. Uh, it, it is that we already said it has no parts, so it cannot have any material components. It also cannot have any intellectual or ideational parts. So it cannot consist of a whole bunch of attributes or platonic forms. It cannot be just composed of those things, right? It cannot feature any of those things. It cannot even have ontological parts. So if you believe in the ontological categories of essence and existence, for example, the unconditioned reality cannot be the union of an essence and an existence. It, it has no parts, so therefore it is immaterial and simple. And because everything depends on the unconditioned reality, everything depends on it, uh, you could say, colloquially speaking, that the unconditioned reality is continuously creating all other realities. All other realities are being sustained in existence by the unconditioned reality. And furthermore, the unconditioned reality uh, is unbounded. It, there's, it has no limitations. It has no limitations because it is absolutely simple. And if it's absolutely simple, uh, there's no internal boundaries and it has no external boundaries either. So it is unlimited. Uh, that would be colloquially, we would say the word infinite, but this is not infinite in a quantitative sense. So this is what we end up with. Um, and obviously I've already gone over my sort of aiming time for the conference and we're already only at this part, but that's okay. I will keep going because I consider this to be sort of a separate public talk, if you will. So at this point, I have tried to argue using sort of a contemporary reformulation of Ibn Sina's argument that there is one absolutely simple, eternal, immaterial, unconditioned reality, which we can call God. And this unconditioned reality is the ground uh, of all other realities. So all other realities depend in their existence at any moment. I'm not, let's be clear. I'm not talking about the Big Bang, right? I have not mentioned the Big Bang. I'm not talking about that this unconditioned reality exists at the beginning of the universe. I'm saying that in the here and now, at any given moment, every reality that is conditioned depends on the unconditioned reality to exist. So the structure of reality at any moment, the ground of that structure the most fundamental reality of that structure would be this unconditioned reality. And that is what I am calling God. And in Neoplatonism, this is known as the one. So if you go back to my sort of larger, larger diagram of the Neoplatonic worldview, I'm trying to actually build or reconstruct the facets of the Neoplatonic worldview using philosophical argumentation. And I've, I think what I've done so far is I've established the first principle of Neoplatonism, 
the absolutely simple God or unconditioned reality. So I'm not done. I've only done like one third of, of what I need to do uh, to make these arguments. So now uh, let us keep going. I've used sort of one famous argument, the contingency argument, which many philosophers of religion, you know, take seriously today. Uh, and let's move to the next stage. So let us consider another argument. And this currently is an argument for the existence of God known as the divine conceptualist argument from eternal truths. Uh, what is this argument? Um, there are many people who, who've used this argument. So Plotinus has used this argument, St. Augustine, Leibniz, Descartes. More recently, um, people like uh, Quentin, Quentin Smith have used this argument and uh, Edward Fazer, um, James Anderson, and Brian Leftow. So it, it enjoys you know, a good circulation uh, in the contemporary field. And all these people use this argument, the argument from eternal truths to prove the existence of God. So let us begin. What do we mean by eternal truths? Um, well, we're talking about propositions. Uh, you could say descriptions of reality uh, that are always true that have always been true, uh, that can never change. They can never not be true. So those would be eternal necessary truths. Well, some people might be like, how could, like, what would that be? So there's a good article written by Spalding back in 1929, uh, which, which actually goes through the whole exercise to come up with using reason to uh, derive, in a sense, to discover uh, what some of these necessary eternal truths could be. So I'm going to put some examples on the slide. So uh, there will be disagreement among people over which truths are actually eternally necessary and which truths are not. But I believe that most people will concede that there are some eternal truths, namely the laws of logic, right? So there are, and, and, and there are different, different systems of logic, but every system of logic uh, begins with certain laws. It could be one law, two laws, or three laws. And these laws are uh, descriptive statements about the nature of reality. So I've put uh, the, the laws of logic on my screen. So for example, the law of identity, A is A. In other words, everything is the same as itself. The law of non-contradiction, nothing can both exist and not exist at the same time and in the same respect or no statement is both true and false in the same respect. That's the law of non-contradiction, the law of excluded middle, right? Something either exists or does not exist, or every statement is either true or false. So these are principles, the laws of logic, they're things that we all assume to be true. Um, but if you think about it, these things are always true. You cannot imagine a state of affairs you cannot imagine a universe where the laws of logic are false. Uh, they, in a sense, they have to be true uh, for reality to even be real. Uh, so those are examples of eternal necessary truths. And I've put other examples that you could consider, but you don't have to agree with everything in my list. Uh, some of these examples that under the laws of logic, they sound like tautologies. You must read it and be like, well, of course, duh. But that's the point. Um, and what I've done here is I've expressed these obvious truths in the form of propositions. And I would say these propositions are eternally true. They are eternal truths. Some examples that are more concrete that are eternal truths, mathematics. So the concept of oneness, the concept of two-ness, the concept of evenness, two plus two equals four, right? Two plus two equals four is always true. There's nothing we can do to make it not true. And for two plus two equals four to be true, the concept of two must eternally be true. And the concept of four must be eternally true. And the concept of addition must be eternally true. The Pythagorean theorem must be eternally true. Uh, the concept of a square or a circle must be eternally true. Uh, so th those are some other candidates, and, and you could expand this. I've given you an exhaustive list, but for this argument to work, you don't have to believe everything in my list. You just need to believe one of these items. So some people think moral values are eternal truths, like justice, compassion. Uh, some people think 
uh, universal qualities like redness, circularity, triangularity are also eternal truths because you can imagine a different world, a different universe. You could even imagine that there's no physical universe, right? That we never existed. Um, but two plus two equals four would still be true even if we didn't exist. So that's what we mean by eternal necessary truth. And, and this is not a very controversial sort of claim to point this stuff out. Um, and again, if you want to be very minimalist, then I would just consider, consider the laws of logic as your eternal truth, right? There is no state of affairs in reality that we could conceive without the laws of logic always holding, always being true. Now, I would also point out in my little list here, these necessary truths, the laws of logic, propositions, mathematical truths, none of these are material objects. These are not material things at all. We can represent them through material things, right? Through ink on a page, through sounds, but the truths themselves, these are not material things. These are not material realities. These are meanings right? This is all intelligible meaning. Uh, none of this is material. Like there's no molecule, there, like the, the first law of logic is not a molecule hanging around somewhere. Um, the number two is not an atom hanging around somewhere. So these are, these truths are not material things. So a question we could ask then is, are these eternal necessary truths? And I've put them on the slide here to remind you, are they actually real or is all of this fictionally real? I know the statement fictionally real doesn't make sense, but by I'm asking, are they truly real or are they just mental fictions that we think we humans with our primate brains, we think this stuff is eternally true, but it's only true within our brains, right? Some people could ask that. So are they true objectively or are they true only at the human mental level. I would propose to you that these eternal necessary truths, whether it's mathematics, the laws of logic, geometric figures, moral truths could be, I would propose that they are really true. And there are different arguments that I could give. Uh, I'm putting some of those arguments on the slide and th there are many arguments. I've put four arguments. So number one, if you consider, if you put human minds aside for a second, you notice that uh, geometric forms are universal. Uh, we see circles and squares and diamonds and this sort of thing. We see multiple instances of this in the physical world, but no physical instance is identical to the geometric form itself. It's like the geometric form is manifested in multiple physical things, but the, the form itself is not physical. Uh, and, and the existence of geometric forms in nature, for example, does not depend on human beings thinking about them. We, could, we, we won't exist and you'll still find you know, geometric forms throughout the natural world. You will still find geometry in nature, even if there's no human to see it. Uh, the laws of logic are not just descriptions of reality, but in a sense, they govern all of reality. So we could cease to exist tomorrow, but the, in any universe, the laws of logic would never be broken, right? Because they actually govern what is possible and what is impossible. Uh, mathematical truths are always true. Even if there were no humans tomorrow to talk about math, the math would not change. Uh, and even science, uh, for us to do science, we need these universal truths and categories such as logic, mathematics, and certain universal qualities. These things have to be assumed as true to give a scientific description of the world. And the scientific description of the world is supposed to tell you how the world is, you know, independent of human subjectivity. So you cannot have science and you can't have, you can't claim that you believe in science if you think that these eternal truths that science depends on are just mental fictions. That's, that's what I'm saying, right? So even Quentin Smith, who's an atheist, he admitted this, that like a person is rational if and only if her beliefs are compatible with these eternal truths like logic and mathematics, among other things. So the philosopher uh, Leibniz uh, writes uh, about this argument and he, he notes, he tells us something very important. He says, look, um, it is true and it is always necessary that the circle is the largest of the isoparametric figures. 
even if no circle ex really existed in the physical world, it would still be true that the circle is the largest of the isoparametric figures. That would still be the case. Um, even if you or I and none of us existed, this would still be the case. So uh, Leibniz is saying that these eternal necessary truths, they are true in an objective sense. They are actual eternal truths. They don't depend on us thinking about them to be true. That's, that's the stage of the argument here. So let us continue then. And let me summarize so far. I am saying that number one, there are some eternal truths and you can take your pick, uh, but um, between the laws of logic, between certain deductive propositions, between mathematics, universals, possible worlds, some of these will be eternal truths. Number two, I'm saying that these eternal truths are not material things. They're not material by definition. Uh, they are informational, they are intelligible and they are meaning, but they're not matter. You could say that they are mental. They are mental phenomena in a sense. Uh, next point, the eternal truths are objectively real. They are not fictions, which is what I talked about before, last slide. And thirdly, these eternal truths, whatever they are, they are not true. They are not grounded by any material things, right? This universe could not exist. These truths would still be true. There could be no universe, these things would still be true. And they cannot be grounded. Their existence cannot depend on human intellects or any intellect of a contingent being because we could, we could fail to exist, right? You could have no humans a thousand years from now, but the mathematical truths would still be true. And if we all die and then another human race comes a million years later and they do mathematics, they will discover the same mathematics that we have. They may use a different language. They may use uh, you know, a, a different symbol instead of a plus sign, but the same mathematical truths that they will discover. So that's what I'm saying. So given all this, given that you have eternal necessary truths, that they are, they are intellectual phenomena, they're not material, and given that they, do not, they don't depend on human minds to exist and they don't depend on material things to exist, we need to ask, what are they grounded in? What grounds the existence of these eternal necessary truths? And what my argument here, and it's not my own argument, I'm just rehashing old arguments. I would say, I would conclude that the eternal necessary truths, whatever they are, if they truly exist here and now and always, they must be grounded by an intellect or a mind that is also eternal and that is eternally thinking about these truths. Okay, just like we think about these eternal truths because they are literally thought content. We think about them. They exist in our minds, but their, their existence cannot depend on us thinking about them because we are not eternal. Their existence must be grounded by another mind, another intellect that is eternal and that is always thinking about those truths. That's the only way they can exist. Uh, and, and this last point, um, you know, some sub arguments. So if there was no intellect at all that was thinking about these eternal truths, uh, there, would be, there would be no truth at all. And, and this, of course, is what Thomas Aquinas has written uh, in, in, in his work, right? So if there's no intellect period to think the eternal truths, there would be no eternal truths, but there are eternal truths. And therefore, there must be one intellect that is eternal that always thinks them. Uh, the next point, this is from Leibniz, and he's also making this. He's saying that, again, um, if nobody thought about these truths, there must be something that is its subject, i.e. these eternal truths are like eternal thoughts, and therefore there must be an eternal thinker who's always thinking the eternal thoughts. Uh, and Quentin Smith, who is an atheist, but he finds this argument at least well-formed, he also concludes that from the existence of these eternal truths, and notice that these eternal truths on my slide, they're all interrelated with one another. Uh, they're part of, they, they form what you would call a conjunction. You can't really separate these eternal truths. So mathematical truths depend on logical truths. 
for example, right? Without the laws of logic, you can't have math. Uh, and then geometric truth depends on, you know, mathematical truth. So all these truths are sort of intertwined. So Quentin Smith says, for example, that there has to be an intellect, an eternal mind uh, that exists that is thinking all of the eternal necessary truths, all of them together. So that is, that is sort of the conclusion of this divine conceptualist argument. Uh, so we can posit, logically speaking, that these eternal necessary truths, they exist and they are grounded within an eternal intellect and eternal thinker. And of course, just as these, these truths are not material by any means and they're timeless, this intellect would be non-material and timeless. Now, in the field of philosophy of religion today, the people who use this argument, and there are many people who use the argument, uh, they claim that this eternal, this eternal intellect is God. Uh, and this is what uh, Edward Faser writes in his book, Five Proofs for the Existence of God, right? So they say that God, the unconditioned reality, the necessary being, is, is the eternal intellect. That is sort of the, the, I won't say consensus, but that is the popular view in the field today. Uh, so that's what Edward Faser writes, that these possibilities and necessities are grounded in God's nature. Now I hear, I am going to launch an objection to that conclusion. Uh, I say that if these eternal necessary truths are grounded within God, within the necessary being, and if they are God's eternal thoughts, then this would mean that there is real complexity within God. In other words, if God is the one who thinks these eternal thoughts, if God is the eternal thinking intellect that has multiple eternal truths, which there are, then God would not be absolutely simple. God would be complex. So I reject the last stage of the divine conceptualist argument. I say that it cannot be God, the eternal intellect that is eternally thinking and contemplating these eternal truths, it is not God. Uh, Lloyd Gerson in his book on Plotinus makes this same argument. He tells us that timeless or eternal truth is essentially complex. I mean, look at the list that I have on the slide here. There are multiple eternal truths. It's not just one eternal truth. There are several of them. So therefore, since eternal truth is complex, God, the necessary being, the unconditioned reality, cannot be the locus of eternal truths. Otherwise, God would be complex. And this is what Lloyd Gerson writes here. Uh, he says, if the one were the locus of eternal truth, it would stand in a real relation to instantiations of eternal truth, but then its simplicity would be undermined. If the one were the locus of eternal truths, the one could not be infinite and self-caused. So God cannot be the eternal intellect, although this is what Edward Faser and Brian Leftow uh, and Augustine and Leibniz, this is what they all believe, but I'm differing from them. I'm, I'm objecting to that conclusion. So what would I say then? Well, if God cannot be the ground of these eternal truths, it is still true that, there, that an eternal intellect must exist to be the ground and locus of eternal truth. What I would say is that this eternal intellect, which I'm going to call the universal intellect, because it literally is, uh, it contains all the universal eternal truths, so this intellect, I accept that it exists, but I will not identify the eternal universal intellect with God. Why? Because the eternal universal intellect is internally complex because eternal truth is complex. So what I say is that you do have an eternal universal intellect because that's what the argument shows, but this eternal universal intellect, it's not God. It is the first or the highest conditioned reality and it depends on God, okay? So to put it colloquially, uh, the eternal universal intellect is not God, but it's sort of like in number two, it's in second place. Uh, it is the first creation of God. It is the first effect of God, and it is an eternal entity that depends on God. 
So notice what we have here then on the slide. The arguments that I've used so far show us, if you accept them, that you have an absolutely simple God, the unconditioned reality, but then you also have a conditioned reality that is eternal and depends on God, and that is the eternal universal intellect. Uh, so if you sort of um, go back to sort of what we talked about, I now have proved the second stage, the second level of the Neoplatonic uh, worldview. That's, that's what you have here. And um, I'm here going to quote the Ismaili philosopher uh, Sijistani, uh, who of course affirms this very model that I'm trying to make an argument for. So according as he describes it, uh, when we think our acts of intellection, those are outpourings of the universal intellect. So when we think, when we discover eternal truth, it could be mathematical truth, it could be moral truth, it could even be scientific truth. When we uh, intuit truth, we are give, given some partial access, not to God, but to the universal intellect. And this is a sort of illumination theory of knowledge that whenever humans intuit truth in their own intellects, uh, we are being informed or inspired by the universal intellect. And this idea, uh, again, many of the Islamic Neoplatonists, you know, they hold this idea and you even find it talked about today among some Muslim groups. So the Aga Khan, the 49th Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims, he has said in 1983 at the Aga Khan University inauguration, he said, and I quote, the divine intellect, Akalikul, both transcends and informs the human intellect. And, and this is exactly what, what he's talking about. He's talking about the universal intellect as the locus of eternal truth. But notice those Islamic Neoplatonists, they never say that the universal intellect is God. Uh, that would be an error uh, within this perspective. So again, um, going back to our large diagram, this is where we are right now. We have God, absolutely simple, unconditioned reality. And God is the eternal creator of the universal intellect, which is the locus of eternal necessary truth and forms. So now let's keep going. Let's move sort of the to the next stage of, of the whole picture, right? So now I'm going to talk about the very famous Kalam cosmological argument. Uh, this argument is probably the most discussed argument in contemporary philosophy of religion and also contemporary apologetics. I mean, everybody loves this argument. Uh, so I'm going to present the argument sort of very quickly. So this argument, um, I have looked at Al-Kindi, Al-Ghazali, William Lane Craig, Robert Spitzer, uh, and uh, David Oderberg, among others. I know there's even people like uh, Andrew Loke who are presenting this argument today. There are many different permutations of it. A lot of people are working on the Kalam cosmological argument. Here's my little simple rendition and it is by no means the best rendition of it, but he, I just wanna show you how the argument works and what it leads us to. So again, for most thinkers today, the Kalam cosmological argument proves the existence of God. Like this is how the argument is taken. So what people do is they say, well, let us look at what we know about the cosmos. And they say that whatever begins to exist has a cause. So that's the first premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. You could restate that premise if you don't like it. You could restate it as from nothing, only nothing comes. So whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise number two, and this is the key premise in the argument, the physical universe, that is the totality of space, time, matter, and energy, has a finite past time. That means, in colloquial terms, the physical universe began to exist a finite amount of time ago. And this is often the most controversial part of the argument, because a lot of people say, well, how do we know that? How do we know this? And there are different arguments offered to support this claim that the universe has a finite past time. Two of the arguments are philosophical, they're not scientific. So for example, Al-Kindi writing a thousand, over a thousand years ago, Al-Kindi talked about how, let us, he, he said, let us assume that the 
past of the world is infinite. Okay, so you go if you go back in time, it'll never end. Al Kindi says, let's assume that's the case. Al Kindi then says, right now we occupy, we exist in the present moment. If we today exist in the present moment, that would mean an infinite amount of time must have already passed in order to reach the present. This is what Al Kindi says. But if an infinite amount of time has already passed, has already taken place, has already been traversed, it would mean that the infinite was completed. But then anything that has been completed, anything that has already passed is not infinite, it's finite. Therefore, Al-Kindi says, the past time of the physical world is not infinite, it is finite, because the past has to already take place in order for us to be at the present. So this is one of the oldest supporting arguments for why the universe has a finite past. Another argument, and Al-Kindi also gives this argument, and then David Hilbert has talked about this in a mathematical context, and William Lane Craig is sort of like the major updater of this. Another argument, which it starts with Al-Kindi, is that you actually cannot have a physical infinity. There's no such thing as an infinite physical body, and there's no such thing as infinite physical amount of time, because as soon as you you suppose that you have a physical infinity, uh, you run into a whole bunch of logical contradictions. So you reach conclusions when you apply a physical infinite and you do different operations with a physical infinity, you end up with two answers that are completely opposite and you violate the rules of logic. I don't have the liberty right now to get into examples of this, but if you look up the thought experiment known as Hilbert's Hotel, you'll find an example. There's a good YouTube video about Hil Hilbert's Hotel. And if you read Al-Kindi's first philosophy, uh, he talks about this. So he says, you know, assume you have an infinite body, like a body of infinite length. And he then says, you know, perform a few mathematical operations on this infinite body and you reach conclusions that violate the laws of logic. So those are two philosophical reasons why the physical world uh, does not have an infinite past. Then there are scientific arguments put forth to support this. Now, science is a little bit difficult to use as proof because scientific arguments are probabilistic, right? The findings of science are, they don't have absolute certainty. Uh, they're empirical and they're inductive. So uh, you may not like some of those reasons, but they're there. So you have the board goo the Vilenkin theorem from 2001, which shows that even for a multiverse, any multiverse or universe that is on average expanding uh, has an absolute beginning point as far as classical physics is concerned. Um, uh, Alexander Vilenkin and Mithani in a 2012 article, which you'll find on Arvix, they actually look at many so-called uh, eternal past models and they find all of those models are actually finite in the past. Um, the second law of thermodynamics is used to support the fact that uh, even if you had many big bangs, it could not have gone back for infinity. One reason being is that the entropy of our universe is quite low, but entropy actually increases over time. So if past time was infinite, entropy would be very large, if not infinite, but entropy is not infinite. Therefore, the past is finite. Uh, there's also this notion, which even Quentin Smith talks about. Quentin Smith is an atheist. But the ratio of uh, cosmic background radiation to starlight is a thousand times um, and not infinite, uh, is a hundred times and not infinite. So uh, what would happen is if you had many big bangs, right? Like if you had multiple big bangs and if you had an infinite number of big bangs, with every big bang, the cosmic background radiation uh, increases. And if you had an infinite number of big bangs and big crunches, uh, you the ratio of current cosmic background radiation to starlight would be virtually infinite, but it's not infinite. It's only 100 times. And therefore, uh, this is used as another example of why uh, current physical knowledge indicates that the past of the universe is finite and not infinite. So those are the different supporting arguments. Um, I won't say I'm an expert in the scientific stuff, but I'm just getting this from the secondary literature that I've cited above. 
So given that, you know, if you, if you take that the universe has a finite past, then the conclusion of this argument would be that the universe began to exist a finite time ago because of a cause that there has to be something, something that exists prior to the universe, something that is not physical, that produces the universe, that causes the universe to come into being because something cannot come from nothing. If the universe came into existence 13 billion years ago or give any amount of time you want, it could not have come into being with, from absolutely nothing. That violates the rules of logic. Therefore, this argument says, that there must have been a metaphysical cause of the universe, a cause that brought the universe into being and the cause itself cannot be space, time, matter, or energy because space, time, matter, and energy came into being with the universe, right? That's what the universe is. And whatever this cause is, so it's metaphysical, I'm not gonna say that it's personal because we don't know that, but whatever this metaphysical cause is, it would have to be powerful enough to produce the universe. So that's what that's what the argument would say. Uh, and, you know, to be fair, most of the people who use this argument, they say that this metaphysical, powerful cause of the universe is God, right? Like this is how they use the Kalam cosmological argument. And that's how it's being run today. So if you keep that in mind, I can sort of share a couple of other arguments that are also sort of along the same lines. So there's another argument called the nomological argument. This is an argument that is not talked about much today, but I think it's, it's grossly underestimated. So I, I think I should uh, go through it. This, the first premise of the nomological argument is simple. It says that there are regularities in nature. A regularity means that the processes of the natural world exhibit a pattern of activity. That is what we call the laws of nature. So if you think about sort of what the laws of nature actually describe, we call something a law because there are certain processes in the universe that recur. They happen over and over again and they're all showing the same pattern of behavior. And that behavior is what we call a law of nature. That is a regularity in nature. So the first premise is completely uncontroversial. Everybody believes, well, I think most people believe that there are laws of nature. So that's the first premise of this argument. And I'm just gonna name some of these laws if you just so you know. So, you know, the four fundamental forces, uh, those are regularities, right? Because they're talking about how material things, particles, atoms, how these things in, you know, interact. The laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws, general and special relativity, quantum mechanics laws, Kepler's laws. All of these are regularities. And this argument, it's not talking about the laws being fine-tuned, okay? It's simply saying there are laws. You could make these laws extremely inefficient for life if you want to, but there would still be laws. And what we call regularity behavior within the universe, uh, such as the fact that water always freezes at a certain temperature, right? Salt dissolves in water, uh, opposite charge particles attract. And we take all this for granted, but all of this is regularity. Uh, this type of regularity, if it was not there, we couldn't do science. The universe would be incomprehensible if there was no behavioral regularity. In other words, things in the universe occur according to a pattern, so we know what's going on. Even Albert Einstein has written in his letters that, you know, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. And he refers to these, these laws of nature, Einstein refers to them as miraculous. He says this is a miracle. So we take it for granted, but it's important to point out. So the argument, the nomological argument says this, the regularities in nature and keeping in mind what a regularity is, right? A regularity is separate instances which conform to a pattern, a pattern that can be mathematically described. So but what accounts for the laws of nature? Why do they exist? 
right? Why does the universe, why does nature behave in a law-like way? That is the question. So there's two answers to this, really. One answer says it's just what it is. It is that, that is to say the laws of nature are an uncaused brute fact. This is like the David Hume perspective. It's just what it is. No explanation. The other explanation for the laws of nature would be that these laws, the law-like behavior of nature exists because there is a supernatural metaphysical regulator that is at every moment guiding the behavior of natural things to be law-like. And that is what the nomological argument says. So here I have a paper from John Foster, and he asked the question, what is responsible for imposing the regularities on the world in the relevant law-sustaining way? Well, it would be hard to think of the cause or causes as lying within the natural realm, whatever may be formally possible. We are at this point, I think, obliged to confine our attention to the options for supernatural causation, the causal imposition of regularities on the natural world by something which lies outside it. So this is one approach to this argument. It would just say, look, either the laws of nature are uncaused, in which case you just arbitrarily stop asking the question, or the laws of nature have a cause, but that cause is within the natural world, in which case you would then ask about those causes, what is responsible for those laws, so that you're, you're stuck in a circle. And the third option is there is a supernatural, i.e. just an entity or reality that is beyond nature that regulates nature to behave in this way. And that is, that is sort of the argument uh, that's being made here. Now, you could take a different approach to the same argument. Um, there are some authors, namely uh, Hildebrand and Metcalf, who just published a paper where they make the same argument, but they use probability. So they say, look, uh, given that the laws of nature exist, and again, we're not talking about fine tuning, right? I'm not talking about how the laws of nature seem to be fine tuned to produce life. I'm not, I'm talking about any law of nature, any law, any regularity. So they say that, okay, um, given that you have regularities, what is a probability to have regularities on naturalism, on human naturalism or primitivism? And what is a probability to have regularities assuming that there is a cosmic regulator that is imposing the regularities. And they argue that the probability of having regularities in nature with, without any supernatural regulator is like exceedingly nothing. It's like exceedingly small. Uh, so from a probability perspective, they argue that there must be a regulator who is guiding and causing the laws of nature to hold because the laws of nature hold like every moment, right? The law of nature is not some one-time thing. We call the law because the behavior is continuous. So at every moment, uh, the, the law is holding and sorry, someone is talking here. At every moment, the law of nature is holding. So this is talking about the continuous subsistence of regularity, which is why we call it a regularity. And again, um, uh, these people uh, who make these arguments, uh, Metcalf, Hildebrand, they all believe that the regulator is God. Like that is what that is what they're. That's why they say divine voluntarism. And finally, and I'm not going to go through the the details of this, but you also have the famous fine tuning argument. Uh, there, you know, I'm, I assume people are very familiar with the fine tuning argument. So I'm not going to spend so much time going through the whole argument. But the basic idea is that there are certain constants. Uh, in physics, the laws of physics are mathematically described by certain constants. And these constants have to be within a very, very small range for life to exist within the universe. So they're fine tuned. Uh, so um, there are different versions of this argument. Um, some people talk about 20 fine tuned constants, 30. Luke Barnes in 2019 has been very conservative. And he says, I'm just going to talk about three constants and he calculates the probability of these three constants 
taking on life permitting values. So these constants could have been different numbers, right? The cosmo cosmological constant has a certain value and it could have taken on different values. So the probability that, that the cosmological constant takes on a value that allows for life in the universe is 10 to the minus 90. So he does this for just three constants. And he says, therefore, if you assume that these constants have not been fine tuned, okay, if you assume there's no fine tuner, you just assume that they just sort of arrived at life permitting values randomly by chance, then the probability of a life permitting universe just on the three constants here is 10 to the minus 136. I mean, that is almost zero. Whereas the probability of a life permitting universe that has been fine tuned by a cosmic designer is what? Is 100%, right? If, if there's a cosmic designer, then that would explain the fine tuning, right? That would tell you, you know, why there is a fine tuned laws of physics. So this is the fine tuning argument and I'm not going to go so much in detail, but again, the people who use this argument, they say that the fine tuner is God. So this is sort of where we're at right now. Um, the Kalam nomological and fine tuning arguments, they are used to demonstrate, to prove that there must exist a supernatural cause of the universe. So the, the cause that began the universe to exist, that caused it to exist. And that cause is also the regulator of the laws of nature. And it is also the fine tuner of the laws of nature. Um, so that's what these three arguments are used. And everyone who uses the argument, they all say, that the cause of the universe, right? The cause of the Kalam cosmological argument, the regulator and the fine tuner is God. That's what they all say. Now, this is where I will object and I will say, look, if we take these arguments, even if we accept them, they don't actually prove the existence of God per se. What they prove is that there is a supernatural and intelligent demiurge. So they prove the existence of a supernatural being that causes the universe and imposes regularity on matter. Uh, I agree with that. Um, but why should we assume that this universe creator and the universe regulator is God? Uh, it could very well be another type of being that is not God, that is lower than God. In fact, this is the point that David Bentley Hart makes uh, in his book. Uh, the idea of a demiurge goes back to Plato's work. And David Bentley Hart points out here that the Kalam argument and the fine tuning argument, they're not really talking about God. They're just talking about a finite supernatural being that certainly has some skills that is actually imposing order on the universe. Um, but this being is not necessarily the ultimate being. And if you think about it, if you think about this sort of more deeply, uh, there already has to be certain, uh, you could say ontological realities that already exist for this supernatural regulator cause and fine tuner to even do its work on the universe. So this being that many people call God, it is a supernatural being that is always acting upon matter. Whereas the necessary being that we proved earlier and the eternal intellect that we also proved earlier, none of those uh, have that quality of directly, directly acting upon material reality. So I would propose then that the quote unquote God that the proponents of the Kalam nomological and fine tuning arguments are talking about and praising, I would propose that this is actually not God. Uh, it is a wise and powerful demiurge. And this demiurge in order to uh, have any sort of mathematical knowledge to fine tune, to have any patterns to impose on material reality, this demiurge has to be receiving information from the universal intellect, which is the eternal mind that is eternally uh, thinking eternal truth. And this universal intellect, in order to exist, because it's complex, depends on God, the absolutely simple, unconditioned reality. So this idea that the actual cause of physical reality 
uh, is not God, but it's a demiurge. Uh, this is found in the Ismaili Neoplatonic writings, among others. So Nasser Khusro writing in the 11th century writes that the maker of the corporeal world is a spiritual substance and has bestowed activity upon each thing among the bodies of the world. So he's literally talking about this demiurge. And if you read the passage and you stop here, you may think, well, he's talking about God, right? God is the maker of the corporeal world. God is the creator of the physical world. But Nasser Khusru says, no, um, we refer to that spiritual substance or supernatural being that has substantial compatibility with the body as the universal soul. If someone refers to it by another name, we are not mistaken in recognizing that it is the maker of the world. So this demiurge, Neoplatonically speaking, is not God. It's the universal soul. Uh, it's not even in second place. It's in third place. Uh, so that's, that's sort of it, like if I use these three arguments, which everybody today thinks they are talking about God, uh, I will use the same arguments and say they prove the existence of the universal soul. So um, I'm sort of at the end now. So let me sort of just uh, summarize what's going on and sort of say, well, if you have this worldview, this Neoplatonic worldview, which is an Islamic worldview, not all Muslims have it, but many Muslims did. How does that, uh, how is that useful now today in philosophy of religion? So in philosophy of religion today, there's a lot of debates that's going on. So there's a debate about divine simplicity and divine timelessness. Uh, they're arguing with each other. You know, is God fully simple? Is he simple with a little bit of complexity? So our answer in the Neoplatonic model would be this. Strong divine simplicity in absolute divine timelessness and eternal creation, that all pertains to God. Okay, so God is the eternal creator of the universal intellect. The creation, the creative act of God is not a temporal act. Okay, it's an eternal act. And the absolutely simple, unconditioned reality, uh, it has no complexity and it, it is not temporal by any means. So that's one solution to that debate. Um, the people who use the uh, divine conceptualist argument when they, they talk about you know, God as the ground of essence and forms, our answer would be that all of this, the locus of eternal essences, forms, and necessity, possibility, that is not God, it's the universal intellect. And what's happening, of course, is that these eternal truths, these eternal qualities, these eternal forms that are in the intellect, they are being emanated and manifested through everything under the intellect. So there is an eternal and continuous emanation from the universal intellect upon the universal soul and upon the world. That's why we can perceive some of these eternal truths. When you discover or when you learn a mathematical theorem, when you learn Pythagorean's theorem, believe it or not, in this model, you have accessed in a minute way the universal intellect in this model. Um, now, there's a lot of talk uh, by Christian theists, Christian uh, philosophers such as Swinburne, Plantinga, and others about God being a maximally great person. Uh, they actually define God as a maximally great person. Um, William Lane Craig defines God as an unembodied soul or a very, very great soul. In this model, uh, when these Christian analytic theists are talking about God and talking about maximally greatest being and all this stuff, because they are using a sort of very anthropomor anthropocentric idea of greatness, right, of great making qualities, I would say that they're actually talking about the universal soul. They're not talking about God in, in God's true reality. Uh, and this universal soul is the, it, tempor it generates the physical world uh, in a sort of temporal way, in the sense that the physical world is not eternal. It began to exist at a certain time, and that is due to the creative activity or generation of the universal soul. So all of the sort of anthropocentric ideas of God that we have, you know, today people are even talking about God being a person, God having personal qualities. Uh, they're talking about God being, uh, God having empathy, um, for example, right? So whenever we project human 
notions, human qualities onto God, we do that because we're talking about the universal soul and our souls are mirror images of the universal soul. So it's quite natural that we think our creator um, has some of the same personal qualities that we do. But when we're doing that, we're not really talking about God and we're not even talking about the universal intellect. We're talking about the universal soul. A final debate that's currently being debated is the relationship between God and time. Uh, the traditional view was that God is absolutely timeless, right? But now some people are saying that no, um, God sort of exists within time or time must may be a quality of God. God, time exists within God. So some people are using this view. And, you know, we have William Lane Craig who says after creation, uh, God is temporal, but before creation, he's not. And we have Ryan Mullins talking about how time is an aspect of God's being. And perhaps we could say God is time or time is an attribute of God. In this model, uh, what we can account for that position of God being within time, but what we would say is that time is an attribute of the universal soul. It is not an attribute of God in the sense of unconditioned reality. And that idea that time exists within the universal soul comes from Plotinus himself, and it's upheld by many of the other Neoplatonists. So I'm gonna end with this quote. So if you sort of take this Islamic Neoplatonic worldview on board, it would also affect uh, how you understand Islam, how you interpret the Quran. And I'm going to show you an example of that because it means that the human spiritual journey within Islam, if you're an Islamic Neoplatonist, human salvation is attained by the human soul reuniting with the universal soul and through the universal soul reuniting with the universal intellect, which is, you know, it's not only the locus of eternal truth, but the universal intellect is also the state of absolute happiness, of absolute bliss, because real happiness comes from the intimate direct contemplation of infinite truth. And that is the status of the universal intellect. So in the, in the Islamic Neoplatonic perspective, many thinkers will say that the highest paradise, the highest heaven, the highest garden is not some physical place, it is the state of attaining union with the universal intellect. So Nasser Khusro, the Ismaili philosopher, writes in one of his works that the ultimate place of emigration or return of all people is to the universal intellect for your own existence originated from intellect as a matter of necessity. Therefore, all particular souls must return to their own universal soul and the universal soul must return to the intellect for whose sake it exists. So just like you have a creative process that is coming from God going downward, this entire process will also go upward. There is an, a descent, a manifestation, but there's also a, an ascent, a miraj in the Islamic sense. So the ultimate goal of the human return to God is the universal intellect. And Nasser Khusru quotes this verse of the Quran which says, verily unto us will be their final destination and return, and with us is their reckoning. And the implication here is that when the Quran uses the plural, when it uses the first person plural, we, us, we did this, you return to us, the Quranic plural is not talking about the absolutely simple God. The Quranic plural is a reference to the universal intellect and the universal soul. That is to say, the speech in the Quran is an expression, a verbalization of a message from the universal intellect and the universal soul. Uh, so that then becomes one of the implications of, of Islamic Neoplatonism, where not only your theology, but your whole interpretation and your soteriology uh, will be fundamentally different. So um, I'm at the end of my sort of formal presentation. As I said, I sort of took my time with this because uh, this is being uh, recorded and I'm going to put this on YouTube. So I thought I'd, I'd do it properly. Um, so in conclusion, then what I've tried to do uh, in this presentation, I've tried to offer a case as to why the Islamic Neoplatonic worldview, which I've depicted here and which has been held 
by many illustrious Muslim thinkers, why this worldview uh, is still respectable uh, and intellectually coherent today, that we can use the resources within contemporary philosophy of religion, we can use the same arguments that contemporary theists believe and agree with, and we can reorder the arguments and reinterpret them to actually argue for the real existence of this Neoplatonic, nevertheless, Islamic worldview. So uh, thank you all uh, very much. Uh, this is the end of sort of the formal part of my presentation. Uh, so for those of you on Clubhouse, you have not seen the slides, uh, but I'll put the video with the slides up. So now what I'm going to do is I see in the chat a, a ton of questions. So I'm just going to sort of look at these questions um, of what's going on here. Uh, some questions are technical. Will this be on YouTube? Let's see here. Uh, somebody asked, can you have a circular chain of conditioned realities? Uh, so the problem with the circular thing is it, it ends up being this. So uh, the circle itself, right? When you have a circle, so you have CR1, which depends on CR2, and then you have a whole bunch more. And then the last element of the circle depends on CR1. So when you have a circle, what you end up with is the notion that CR1 depends on itself. CR1 depends on CR1. Uh, but a conditioned reality, by definition, cannot depend on itself. If it depends only on itself, it's an unconditioned reality. Uh, so you cannot have a circle of conditioned uh, realities. Uh, another question, does it mean that universal intellect and soul are conditional? Yes. So in this system, only God is unconditioned reality. The universal intellect is the first conditioned reality, not temporally, but logically. So the universal intellect depends on God to exist. And the universal soul is the second conditioned reality, and it depends on the universal intellect in order to exist. And everything else under the universal soul is also a conditioned reality. Uh, someone says, Rumi says, Allah knows when a leaf will drop off a branch of tree. Where does this fit into the Neoplatonic theory? Basically, when we talk in the Neoplatonic interpretation, when we talk about God being all-knowing, or God's knowledge containing all things, uh, as if we're talking about divine knowledge as sort of uh, in terms of discrete contents, right? Discrete contents, i.e., complex truth, if that's what divine knowledge is, then that is referring to the universal intellect. If we just if we think about divine knowledge as a real attribute of God, again, that would apply to the universal intellect. It would not apply to God as unconditioned reality because unconditioned reality is absolutely simple. So unconditioned reality does not actually have any attributes. And we can only talk about unconditioned reality uh, using negation, really. We can only negate all complexity and all conditionality from it. Someone asked, if the attributes of God are in reality to be ascribed to universal soul, what role does intellect play in divine nature? Um, I wouldn't say, so what I would say is that certain attributes that we ordinarily ascribe to God, such as sort of personal qualities, those would apply to the universal soul. Then other divine attributes would apply to the universal intellect. That itself is its own topic, right? Like I could do a whole talk on sort of which divine attributes, because like, because uh, Ibn Arabi does this and the Ismailis do this. Like they go through all the different divine names and they actually assign particular divine names to different levels because the divine names have different meanings. Some divine names have purely negative meanings or can be understood purely negatively. So those would be names of God as unconditioned realities. Other divine names have actually positive uh, divine meanings, po positive meanings. And uh, those, those divine names would apply to the universal intellect and the universal soul. Uh, does the intellect possess attributes separate compared to the soul? Well, the you know, every higher reality, you could say, envelops and includes the lower reality. Uh, so from the perspective of the universal intellect, the universal soul is not separate from it. The universal intellect encompasses the universal soul. But from the perspective of the universal soul, it is separate 
from the universal intellect and the universal soul, because it is created by or derived from the universal intellect, it is limited compared to the universal intellect. As you go down the hierarchy, you get more complexity and therefore with more complexity, you get more limitation. So by the time you reach the physical cosmos, it's very, very complex, right? And things are, are quite limited. So, you know, space and time are constraints, right? Spatial position, te temporal, this is all limits. This is all due to constraints. And as, the, as you go down the ontological hierarchy, there is more constraint and, and actually more complexity. Someone is saying, um, would Islamic Shia Ismaili Neoplatonism equate prophethood or imamath in their eternality or particularly with the universal intellect or soul? Okay, very good question. So uh, what you find is that Shia Muslims and the Sufis, okay, so Shias, Ismailis, Sufis, they have this hierarchy and then what they do is they identify uh, certain spiritual ideas like the nur, the light of Muhammad, or the light of Ali. They identify them with the universal intellect. That's what they do. So what Sufis call the Muhammadan reality, al-Hakika, al-Muhammadiya, they say that is the universal intellect. Sometimes some Shia Muslims, so some of the Ithnashri Shia, for example, they have said that the light of Muhammad is the universal intellect and the light of Ali is the universal soul. So you find that, you find that as well. Uh, someone said, does Surah Yasin apply to universal soul? I'm guessing that you're talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking about um, Surah Yasin verse 12, right? Wakula Shain Asenahu Fi Imamin Mubin. So yes, um, Okay, you said you confirmed it. So that that verse, which says, you know, we have encompassed or we have reckoned all things in a manifest imam. So yeah, uh, the Sufis, the Shia, the the, the Ismailis, um, there is a, a reading of that, an interpretation where they would say that the imam in the imam mubin. Uh, refers fundamentally to the universal intellect because the universal intellect at the metaphysical level, literally contains all things, right? It contains all things. Uh, and there are other Quranic verses that talk about how God has recorded all things in a kitab, in a divine writing, commonly translated as book, uh, but technically would be divine writing. So the Quran talks about a divine writing where God has encompassed everything. And that's not the Quran, right? This kitab, it's called kitab mubin, and it's not the Quran. So in this framework, you could correlate what the Quran says about many matters with this. The kitab mubin, the sort of transcendent, all-encompassing kitab that the Quran talks about many times. So it says kitab mubin, it says kitab hakim, it says kitab maknun, it says kitab hafid. All of these refer to the universal soul, basically, right? Because the universal soul contains all of sort of the intellectual raw material, uh, the ayat, Allah, that will then be manifested in the physical world, right? So the kitab that the Quran talks about, it contains ayat, signs. And then the Quran says that these signs are shown, they are manifested in the human soul, because the human souls come from the universal soul, and they're also manifested in the horizons, right? The Quran says, God signs, the ayat Allah, are manifest within you and in the outer universe. And those signs come from the kitab. So the kitab is the universal soul, and the manifestations of the divine signs from the universal soul happen both in individual souls and in, co in the cosmos because the universal soul inscribes, again, kataba inscribes these archetypes in prime matter, and then you get the physical world. So, so there's actually some great um, complementarity, like you could correlate 
a lot of Quranic statements with this Neoplatonic worldview. And many thinkers did that. Ibn Sina did this, the Ismailis did this, Mullah Sadra did this, Ibn Arabi did this. So it, it's, it's quite common. Um, someone says, does the Miraj of Prophet Muhammad mean his connection to the universal intellect? Yes. Yeah. So according to Ismaili thought specifically, because they write about this in detail, uh, the Prophet's Miraj culminated in his spiritual, not physical ascent and union with the universal intellect. So that was the Miraj. And then, you know, after when the Prophet returns from the Miraj as an individual soul, as an individual in the world, he, he is a reflection of the universal intellect. The prophet is a reflection of the universal intellect on earth after the Mehraj. So in some, in some higher way, he never really left the Mehraj, uh, right? He still reflects the source. Uh, he reflects the highest point uh, of that ascent. All right, uh, any more questions? So what I'm gonna do now is we have, I'm gonna see, uh, is there anyone in um, Clubhouse who's heard this? And of course you didn't have the slides, but if anyone in Clubhouse wants to come to the Clubhouse stage and ask a question, you could do that if you'd like. Let's see here. I don't really see anyone. So. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Sure. Dr. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Um, one of the things I had uh, kind of trouble uh, getting my mind around is why you wh why we would characterize the kind of conjunction of all mathematical logical truths as an intellect. And what is the necess necessity of contemplating it? as an intellect that's always thinking? So yeah, great, great question. And, and I'll admit that the this is, again, the divine conceptualist argument. Um, I'll admit that for, 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 for many people on first look or second look or third look, um, it takes some getting used to to grasp the, the logic at play here. So the idea here is that the laws of logic and the mathematical truths, for example, the idea here is that these are eternally true and they're real. They're not fictional, right? So then the question is, these things really exist, but what kind of an existence are, do they have? Uh, so they're not material. Would you agree? Like the laws of logic, you know, mathematical truth, they're not material things. They're not material objects. Absolutely. Okay. And they cannot actually subsist within a material object. Yeah. Right. So you may, somebody might say, well, no, you know, you can write two plus two equals four on an eternal rock and therefore it exists eternally. But the actual writing of two plus two equals four is just a symbol. Uh, it takes a mind to look at the symbol and realize the meaning uh, behind that symbol, right? So they, they're not material. So then what kind of a thing are they? And the, the sort of close, in terms of human experience, the, t the kind of entity that the eternal truths are, are thoughts, right? So we grasp these in thought. So they have... Uh, mental, they are sort of mental existence in a sense. And I, they, I accept that for you and me, that they're a mental existence, but right. like the, the jump towards, therefore, the, they, they must be subsisting, they must be existing because some, some entity is universally, quote unquote, thinking about them, quote unquote, all the time. I mean, yeah. it, it's not even clear to me that all the time makes sense when you're talking about a universal intellect. This is kind of a, I don't, it's a jump. It's a kind of anthropo, anthro, <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, it's late over here. Anthropo, oh, no, that's fine. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphization. Right? Right. Yeah. That, like, it, it I, I don't know what the necessity of that is. So let's put it this way, right? Um, let's start with sort of what you agree with so far. So, uh, we, there could be, we could all die. Uh, there could be no human intellects, right? There could be no intellects. 
whatsoever, yeah. these yeah. would still be true. Yeah. And that these are real truths. So they're not fictional. Yeah. So then the question is, is in what sense do they exist then? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I obviously can't offer you any positive answers, but to, to jump to the conclusion of it, it must be something else thinking about them, quote unquote, thinking about them like that. That's that's an unnecessary step. So I think I For, think what happens is that what we're trying to do is that these things always exist. And we're trying to explain their existence, like what accounts for the fact that they always exist. We know they always exist. They're eternal truths. And we know that they're not physical. So therefore, they're metaphysical. And they always exist. And they are only perceptible and known by an intellect, by a mind. And it can't be, they cannot depend on our minds because we are, we are contingent, we're not eternal. Therefore, it's sort of like a process of elimination, given that they exist and they cannot be, their existence cannot be grounded in our minds and they are mental content. They are, these truths are, this is thought content. So then they have to be the thoughts of an eternal mind. And the eternal mind must always be thinking these, because if it was not always thinking these, then these truths would not be eternal. So then that would mean that there's there's a time or a moment where two plus two is not four anymore. D does time even exist in the universal? I, I would think that, no, that, that no. would be a property ascribed to the, no, the that's you know, right. universal soul. But when I say, so I notice I um, when I say that the intellect is eternally thinking the truths. Um, so I'm not talking about a temporal type of thinking. I, I think maybe the word thinking, we associate thinking as a temporal process, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I'm not talking about a, a process of thinking. I'm saying mm -hmm. that in this eternal mind, so when you think about something non processually, that means that that content, the truth is present in your mind and you are aware of it and conscious of it. So at sure. that moment, so, so what that would mean for the universal intellect is that because there's no time, it would mean that for this universal intellect, all the eternal truths are present in that mind. Yes. So a realm of thought or truths exists. Yeah. So what? So these truths are the contents of a single act of thought. And if there's an act of thought, just like we grasp these truths when we have an act of thought, right? That's when you grasp them. So like you think about the pipe that you think two plus two equals four. So at that moment, Two plus two equals four is your thought content, and you have an act of thought. Now, the diff the thing is that my act of thought and your act of thought, it doesn't last forever, right? You think about something, and then you think about something else. But the intellect, the eternal intellect, has one act of thought, and that act of thought never passes. It always is, and the the act of thought has, you know, it houses content, and that content of the intellect's act act of thought is all these necessary truths. Well, I, I'm beginning to uh, kind of understand your position. I don't think I'm all the way there. Um, and I don't, totally I, I don't want to fine. take up I mean, too I, much time. That's totally fine. I don't expect anyone on first or second or third look to sort of be like, oh, I'm totally on board, right? This is, uh, consider mm -hmm. this a proposal. Uh, this is sort of like, if you wanted to reconstruct Islamic Neoplatonism using the resources we have today in philosophy, this is how you would do it. I, I, I did have two other questions. So I, I don't know if, if you'd uh, like me to ask those or if you, if well, you want you to know, see if anyone I don't, else. I don't see any other hands up, so you can go right on ahead. Okay. Um, so 
the first one is that um, uh, in the second part of your universal intellect discussion, um, you kind of, you know, borrowed from the the tools that you developed in the Avicenna's Proof of God, saying that this can't be, you know, that universal intellect is made up of um, things that are either, I, 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 and you didn't explicitly mention this, but you, you, you talked at some point that it can't be, uh, it can't be simple, right? Um, but, but like in the Avicenna Proof of God, when you're talking about a cat, a cat is a physical object. But then in the universal intellect uh, portion, you're talking about uh, like uh, laws of nature and this and that. So you can't really uh, think of it as being made up of parts in the same way. Can you? So I, I think I'm not sure if you're talking about this slide, but I have put the slide up. Right. So after um, I presented the sort of eternal truth argument, as you can see here, uh, mm -hmm. I argued I argued um, let me sort of go back one here. So what I argued is that most th most philosophers today say that the the mind that is the locus of eternal truth is God. That's what most people say today. I say that no, there is an eternal mind that is thinking eternal truth, but that eternal mind, that intellect is not God because eternal truth is complex. There are many eternal truths, right? So content-wise, it's complex. And then the intellect that is thinking eternal truth, right? The, there's a duality there between um, the thinker, uh, the act of thought, and then the content of thought. So to me, this is a form of complexity. There's like three, there's sort of at least two types of complexity the thought content, the eternal truths are complex. And then there's a distinction between the thought content, the object of thought and the act of thought, and then also the thinker. So my argument then is that we can accept that there is an eternal intellect that is the locus of eternal truth, but we do not identify that with God. We identify that with the universal intellect, which is a contingent being that depends on God. Um, now, this is actually not different from what Ibn Sina says. Ibn Sina also believes that there is a first intellect that is an eternal emanation from the absolutely simple God. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, maybe. It's just my observation was that, like, let's say the, um, the complexity of a cat right that that's one thing that we dealt with and i think it's on unfairly solid ground but like let's say it, to take a mathematical example the 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 difference between the like you know i don't know the cosine law and the pythagorean theorem you can say one is a part of another but you can't really say that it's two different things right and so there therefore it it, it has this kind of complexity right I, I i don't think that's that's as that's on um, as solid a ground. So, I mean, right? well, I, it, it depends. I think that even, so your example that you've given, like cosine laws and, and stuff, that may be, it may be, you, you could maybe say that, no, these are just different aspects of the same thing, right? That these are just two ways of looking at the same thing. That's fine. But what I'm saying here is that these eternal necessary truths are certainly not identical to one another. So it's not obvious to me that they're not, in some sense, all aspects of the same thing, for example. Like, like, like you can't really, I don't think you can take out the Pythagorean theorem and put in some other theorem and the rest of mathematics makes sense, right? For example, right? Well, Obviously, there, 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 there are ways people do that, you know, topology, what have you, right? But, mm -hmm. but but it's not it's not quite you know the the, the idea of uh, of uh, simplicity and complexity when we're dealing with a cat is you know you can take the heart out of a cat right you can take the atom out of a cell but it, but it's really not the same thing when when you're dealing with the realm of thought yeah but i think the point i'm making is that sort of 
any sort of complexity means contingency. It's not just material. So, so the cat is a, is a material complex. It also has some metaphysical complexity. I mean, if you, if you go down to it, there's sort of other types of complexity. There's form and matter, this whole thing. Um, this type of complexity within the universal intellect, it's what you would call formal complexity. So the universal intellect is the locus of a multiplicity of truths, a multiplicity of forms, of qualities, right? So circularity and triangularity are not identical. They're not the same thing. Um, if you believe in eternal moral truth, right? Compassion and justice are, are not the same thing. So what I'm saying is that you have real complexity and it's not material. I would grant you that. Like, it's certainly not the same thing as like the body parts of a cat. And I'm not saying it is, but it is still a kind of complexity. And if, if this complexity exists in God, it would also mean that, well, can God be God like without the eternal necessary truths. If you say God can be God without these eternal necessary truths, then technically these eternal necessary truths do not exist at the level of God. They are actually contingent things that depend on God, right? Uh, which automatically implies that they exist at this lower level, which we're calling the universal intellect. Otherwise, somebody might say that the eternal necessary truths are actually within God, essentially. So they are the actual contents of God's essence. So God's essence contains, is comprised of the laws of logic, you know, um, mathematical truths. And that would actually mean uh, that God is composite. God is complex, not physically, not physically, but uh, formally. God is formally complex. God is ideationally complex. And that's where it becomes a problem. Now, one other solution people have used is where they try to say that, okay, these things exist in God, but when they exist in God, they're actually all the same thing. Uh, I, again, don't accept that because that's sort of like making an argument and then at the last stage uh, denying like the first premise of the of the original argument. You know, the, the, the eternal truths exist. They have to exist in a certain way. Oh, they exist in God. And then you add, oh, but, but in God, like they're actually all the same thing. But by definition, like to even talk about eternal necessary truths, they're they're distinct by definition. Otherwise, they wouldn't be that. So those are the different solutions, um, but I reject I reject all of those moves uh, on the grounds of what I call strong divine simplicity. But again, I'll admit that there are other thinkers, so the Thomists, who have no problem putting all of this in God, and there are other thinkers, you know, who um, uh, <laughs> there are other thinkers who would say that uh, God is complex, uh, metaphysically complex, and, and they'll sort of run with that. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, if we if you accept that God is metaphysically complex, you can't use Ibn Sina's argument anymore uh, to prove that God, and and you can't prove that there's only one complex God because you actually could theoretically have more than one complex God because that whole whole partless simplicity argument um, it it wouldn't operate if you believed in a, a internally complex God. I I think my objection was more towards thinking about uh you know universally truths as somehow contingent on one another r r rather than uh you know an objection to a, to a quote unquote simple god yeah i mean i i think that these truths that we have i've grouped here i think you could arrange them in a structure where certain truths are contingent and combinations of other truths Right, I think you'll certainly find that, um, and I think there's a good case for that. In fact, I would my case that there's only one universal intellect sort of depends on the fact that these truths are intertwined. They're not identical, but like one truth, like the Pythagorean theorem, right? For that truth to be eternally true, there are other eternal truths that have to obtain, right? So 
there is a certain internal structure of these truths. I would completely agree on that point, but I don't think that negates their complexity. I think what that what that does is that if all these eternal necessary truths form a superstructure of sorts, then the intellect that grounds the truths, it has to be only one intellect. You can't have 10 intellects and then divide these things up among the 10, right? Then, then you would have an issue. Uh, so mm -hmm. that, that's what I would say. Um, I, if it's okay with you, I just want to turn to uh, some of the other chat questions. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so let's see here. Why was Ismaili theological expression needed to be Neoplatonic? Um, it, it's not that somebody came and told the Ismailis, hey guys, like we need to be Neoplatonic, you know, like it was more like the Ismaili thinkers and, and the Islamic philosophers and the Sufis, they found that the Neoplatonic model, which I've presented here, they found this model provides the fullest and most logical explanation of human experience in the world. This is why they like the model, right? They, it's not like some dogma council came and said, all right, guys, we got to be Neoplatonic. It wasn't like that. They, they found a model that, that, that using which they were able to account for both sort of worldly experience, science, and religion. And this is sort of what they settled on. The Ismailis were one of the early champions of Neoplatonism. And after the Ismailis, like a whole bunch of people sign on partially or fully. Uh, let's see here. Um, someone says, how can we explain the creation of the universal intellect and the universal soul in this model? Wouldn't that creation require the presence of a will and a mind to direct those creations? Wouldn't the existence of a timeless conditioned reality be problematic? So... For starters, I don't think the existence of an eternal conditioned reality is problematic at all. Um, we would simply say that this God, unconditioned reality, uh, has always uh, maintained or sustained the existence of the universal intellect. And the universal intellect is it's eternal. It exists all the time, right? It doesn't even undergo change, but it always depends on the creative act of the unconditioned reality. Now you had a question of, well, don't we need a will or a mind for this creation to happen? So that's a very good question. In truth, we cannot ascribe any anthropomorphic quality to God. Uh, we cannot literally ascribe a will in the ordinary sense or a mind to God because that would all compromise divine simplicity. So when it comes to God, we cannot really say why God creates the universal intellect. We don't know why, uh, and, and there's no answer for that question. We just know that there is a universal intellect, and we know that there is a universal soul, but we don't know why there's a universal intellect. And we don't really know why, you know, there's a universal soul. Uh, and, and that's a very sort of apophatic sort of negative theology approach. And that's what I do. Now, some people want to be more positive theology, and that's okay. Uh, someone has asked, how do you define Wahdat al-Wujud within the system of thought? Well, this system of thought, I'm glad you asked. This model is completely compatible with Wahdat al-Wujud. In fact, all of the major thinkers who teach Wahdat al-Wujud uh, from Ibn Arabi onward, all of them had this model. So Ibn Arabi's uh, successors, uh, who are, you know, uh, Jandi, uh, Fargani, uh, Kunawi, uh, uh, Jilli, uh, Kaysari, all of these people, all the Akbarian thinkers, they all believe in Wahdat al-Wujud. So they all believe that God is the absolute reality, and they believe that all these things that are quote unquote under God, they are all manifestations of God in a limited way. So in, in the absolute sense, there is the one reality of God that is sort of shining through the universal intellect and shining through the universal soul and shining through the cosmos, which is why <coughs> if you interpret the model within the Wahdat al-Wujud paradigm, then 
some of my explanations here when where I'm basically saying that the type the, the God as understood by many Christian analytic thinkers is not the absolutely simple God. It's either the universal intellect or the universal soul. That is a, that position uh, within what the Wujud uh, makes total sense, right? Uh, so you have to distinguish between God as such, God in his essence, and God as experienced by human beings within different contexts, which most of the time will be the universal soul. But the universal soul in a Wathathal Wujud paradigm is a manifestation of God. It's not other than God. It's not something like totally removed from God. It's a manifestation of God. So if I say that, you know, uh, the God that William Lane Craig describes for the most part is the universal soul, it's not meant to sort of uh, you know, deep, you know, be insulting towards those people, but it's to say that many theologians, when they do theology, they're talking about God as God is manifest in the form of the universal soul. They're not talking about God as such. Um, how does the concept of Satan or negative thoughts fit in? I can't get into that right now, but basically, well, I say I can't get into it, and then I try to answer, so I'm very inconsistent. So what happens is that the universal soul is not perfect because the universal soul is sort of two, it's two levels removed from God. Uh, the universal intellect is perfect, but the universal soul is not perfect because there's some ontological distance between the soul and, and the intellect and God. So the universal soul creates a creation, which is our souls and our world, but it does not create a perfect creation. There is some deficiency within creation, and that deficiency exists because every level is more limited and more finite than the level above. So the byproduct of finitude, the byproduct of imperfection, the byproduct of ontological deficiency manifests as what we call natural evil and you know, human evil. Uh, now, I can't get into more from that, but to make a long story short, what you asked, do negative thoughts come from God? Negative thoughts do not come from God. Uh, where does prophecy fit into this? Hakika, Muhammadiyah, how would philosophers and Sufis show the strength of Islamic theology? Okay, uh, prophecy comes into this in general, where the prophet is a individual soul. I'll go back to a different diagram to get into this. So the prophet's soul is an individual soul that has achieved union with the universal intellect and the universal soul. What that means is that the soul of a prophet is continuously receiving emanation from the universal intellect and the uh, universal soul. And that prophet they receive these intelligible emanations, they receive these spiritual truths, and they translate those into human language for their community. So prophecy fits right into this model. Um, the other thing is that in the actual uh, scriptures, the Bible, the Quran, or whatever, um, the entity that speaks in the voice of God in this model, that entity often will not be like the, the, the absolute unconditioned reality does not actually speak in human language at all. It does not have any sort of emotion or anything like that. Whereas the divine voice in the Quran, in the Bible, will be either the universal intellect or the universal soul. Uh, a general thing that we find the Ismailis say is that in the Quran, when God speaks in first person singular, so like I created humankind and jinn to worship me, for example, uh, that I, or when God says to Moses in the burning bush, you know, I am your Lord. And so take off your shoes. That is the speech of the universal soul. And there are other verses in the Quran where God is described in third person. So he will do so and so, right? Your Lord will do so and so. That refers to the universal intellect. Now, there are some places, a few places, not all, but there are a few places where when the Quran talks about God in the most transcendent language, that is referring to absolute, simple, unconditioned reality. The example of such a verse 
would be Surat al Ikhlas, Kulhu Allahu Ahad Allahu Samad. That refers to God as unconditioned reality. But when God is described in the Quran with different names, that refers to the universal intellect and the universal soul. And when the divine voice of the Quran speaks with we, you know, we created this, we did that, we sent this, that is referring to the universal intellect and the universal soul together. That's why that is a plural we. So that's how you would, and in fact, that example of the plural we being the universal intellect and universal soul, this is what Nasser Khusra writes in his text. He takes this verse, verily unto us will be their final destination and return. And he says, that is talking about the return of souls to the universal soul and the return of the universal soul to the universal uh, intellect. All right, well, um, I don't see any more, or, oh, sorry, uh, the part of the question was Hakika Muhammadiya. So Hakika Muhammadiya in Islamic Neoplatonism, that is the universal intellect. So the light of Muhammad, the reality of Muhammad is the universal intellect. It's not God, uh, and it, it's not just the physical person uh, of Muhammad. So I'm just seeing here, I don't think, or there's a question here. Does the real book Al-Kitab, uh, okay, so I mentioned this earlier. I said that in, in the Quranic language, the Quranic Kitab, the Kitab that contains all the divine signs, the Kitab that contains every single creature, right? That's how it describes the Kitab. That Kitab is the universal soul. What is the Quran then? Well. The Quran is a verbal, symbolic representation of the content of the universal intellect and the universal soul. So the kitab refers to this higher level metaphysical realities, and the Arabic Quran is the manifestation of kitab because the prophet wanted, the prophet received direct vision, direct knowledge of the kitab, of the universal intellect, the universal soul and their content. But the prophet had to communicate that kitabi signs to people who do not perceive the kitab. So the prophet communicated that in the form of Arabic Quran. And that's the Quran that we recite today. So there's a difference ontologically between Al-Kitab and Al-Quran. Al-Kitab is the metaphysical, Al-Quran is the physical, but Al-Quran is how you access Al-Kitab. And of course, in the Shia tradition and in the Ismaili tradition, uh, the access to Al-Kitab did not end with Prophet Muhammad. The Imam of Shia Islam, whether it's the Twelvers or the Ismailis, the Imam is the human manifestation of Al-Kitab. So the Imam is often called the speaking Kitab of God. And that's because, metaphysically speaking, the Imam is the manifestation on earth of the universal intellect. Just like the Prophet himself on earth was the manifestation uh, of the universal intellect. So anyway, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot more one could talk about, but what I'm really interested in here is sort of saying, look, we have uh, Islamic Neoplatonic worldview uh, and that this Neoplatonic worldview is not some outdated thing from hundreds of years ago. Uh, we can easily demonstrate its relevance and perhaps its existence using the tools and arguments of contemporary uh, philosophy of religion. So I'm going to uh, end it here. I, I can't believe I said I would only be 30 minutes. I clearly don't know how to keep time. But anyway, at least now I know that whatever I present tomorrow, I'll have to just do it really, really fast. So I thank you all uh, for coming. Um, this has been recorded. I will upload this uh, onto uh, YouTube. So thank you all very much uh, and have uh, have a great evening.